Today I'm showing you how I turn this into that. What is my workflow to edit my GR3 pictures from scratch? How I approach using presets and adding final touches with different mask features. And if you don't use a GR, you can stay here because my workflow is basically the same for all cameras. I'll start by order of importance and what you are more likely to have clicked on this video for editing a file from scratch. A lot of people are considering getting one of the GR cameras because of their film simulation with the intention of shoot uh, mostly JPEG. Everyone has its own approach to photography and I don't want to say that you are doing something wrong if you are not shooting raw, but I still believe it would be missing out a lot on what the GR cameras have to offer. One thing you realize maybe by looking at this unedited picture is uh, how underexposed it looks. With experience after shooting with the Ricoh for about two years, just like a lot of digital cameras, you are better off underexposing and protecting your highlights. Usually shoot with the exposure compensation at minus 0.3, minus 0.7. First thing I do is activate the lens correction profile and tick the box to remove the chromatic aberration. I used to like the natural big netting of the lens, but recently I prefer getting rid of it with the correction profile. Now that the distortion has also been taken care of, I can see if any of the upright modes work well. I'm often using auto or vertical. If it looks too funky, I stick to just correcting the level only to have a horizontally aligned photo. There are also times where I purposely tilt my photos and in such a scenario any of the upright modes will not work. Next step is the basic settings tab where I do a lot of work. I start by adjusting my overall exposure up to a point where I have a correct exposure or in very contrasty scene up to a point where my main point of interest in the photo is correctly exposed and would adjust the rest with more localized controls like the masks if desired. Once I'm happy with my exposure I then use the highlights, shadows, white, blacks and contrast sliders to balance my photo and make it more flat in a way. I don't really use these sliders to stylize my pictures, but more to give them a solid starting point. The contrast and colors will be handled with the next steps like the tone curve, HSL, calibration and all that. Finally, little yet very important section of this basic panel are the present sliders, texture, clarity and dehaze. The most important to me is the clarity one. To get this more organic and softer look in the highlights, I pull my clarity in the negative territory from minus 15 up to minus 3 in certain cases. If you go further than that, it can start to look a bit weird and unnatural. I rarely adjust the texture slider and might come back to the dehaze later to add a final touch of contrast as I like how it affects the image in a more refined way than the contrast slider. Moving to the tone curve and I will try to not overcomplicate it. I use the point curve to bring back my contrast and with that I can control more uh, than using the contrast slider. I reduce a little bit the dynamic range by pushing up my entry point to have a very very subtle fade. I also bring down the exit point to have no pure whites in my picture as I want this photo to be bright and make us feel that the sun was here and strong that day. I lower the curve in the shadow and the black parts, but I'm bringing back my curve above this middle line pretty quickly after that. Doing so, I have bright mid-tones and highlights, and as we lower them in the basic settings, they won't blow out too quickly. Next up, we play with the different RGB channels, and here I don't use them to color grade my pictures. I will create the exact same curve on all the three channels by copy-pasting the settings. I like to add this little S-curve there because it adds a little bit more contrast and somehow a very pleasing saturation and richness to the colors all across the frame. Finally is the region curve, or I don't really know the exact name for this one, but whatever. Here I play mostly with the highlight parts. I bring up the dividing point to somewhere around 80, 85, and then bring those highlights down until where it looks good to me. This little change will help to create a matte looking finish in the brightest part of the image. I should have mentioned it first, but I sometimes tweak my um, white balance if not happy with uh, how it came out of the camera. Here I made it up a touch and brought my tint to plus 10. Next online is the calibration. This is a very interesting tool to affect your colors globally. Unlike the HSL where you can dial your colors very precisely and individually, the calibration tool is here more to tell Lightroom to interpret the colors as a whole differently. When moving the red sliders, for example, you are affecting all the red colored pixels in the frame. There are red pixels in all colors, but in different proportion. So that's why when you make some changes, it will have an effect on the whole image. I prefer using Lightroom Classic over the other Lightroom version, 
as it offers all the library features, but also because this calibration tool is not available there. The shadow slider is different than the other ones, and I sometimes use it as I did there to add a very subtle green tint to start building up the style and color grade of this image. Be careful with the blue slider, because if you move it too much to the left, you can really end up with fake looking teal and orange look. Then we fine tune the colors with the HSL tab. Here you can adjust them individually and very precisely. Changing the hue, the saturation and the luminance of each of them is possible, but I try not to overdo it because I like my pictures to be stylized, but I want to avoid making them looking unnatural at all costs. Moving the yellows toward greens make any greenery more uniform and more green. I like that look. I reduce the saturation and boost the luminance of the blues. This is something pretty recurrent in my style. Interestingly, I love blue as a color and a lot of my clothes are blue, but I don't like when there is too much of it in my photos. I want my sky to be a nice complement, not the star of the show, but I have to be careful because bringing the saturation too low could start to look unnatural. I adjusted the other colors to my liking before moving to the cherry on top, the color grading tab. For this picture, I went for orange in the shadows, yellow in the mid-tones, a touch of teal in the highlights, and a hint of yellow in the global wheel to wrap everything with a little bit of warmth. As you can see, I usually move the ring at a pretty high saturation value to see what works best. Once I'm happy with the U, I dial it down and try to be subtle, rarely going above 10, more than that would start to be too much. Here I did it by feel and tried different hues, but it can also happen that I already have a clear idea of what I want, and in this scenario I would not do this trial and error kind of method. I added a touch of luminance in my shadow to add a little softness that is another little piece of the puzzle to create this vintage yet natural soft look I like. Finally, I went straight to the effects tab. I usually don't do anything that affects the sharpness or noise reduction. I don't see the need of it in 99% of the cases. Here I added some grain to complete the style I wanted for this picture that felt a bit nostalgic to me. 25 for the amount and then increase the size and roughness to make it more appearance but if you prefer finer more discrete grain you can keep them at default values or even reduce them a touch. Now that I'm happy with how it looks let's make this a preset and a quality versatile one. To do so I tick the profile, all basic settings except exposure and white balance, tone curve, HSL, color grading and calibration. I keep out the lens correction because I want to apply this on photos coming from various cameras. I also did not include the exposure and white balance as they are values that are very individual to each pictures and it does not take a lot of time to adjust them anyway. Detail and upright are also out of the preset. I always create them with the Adobe color profile as I have been editing with it for years and it makes the preset available for any cameras. Now if I want to use the Astia or classic Chrome profile on my uh, Fuji files for example, I would do it on a very individual basis. The idea is to have a quality preset that makes a good starting point for any photos. Now that we have some quality presets, I am showing you how I use them to edit my pictures. I will use my go-to from my preset pack available on my website. Now that I have a bunch of looks that I like, I always edit with my presets as starting points and do minor adjustments. Editing from scratch, as we just did, is something I don't do a lot in recent days. As usual, I start with my lens correction, then jump to the upright tab and did a bit more adjustment than usual to have straight lines. Then I wanted this picture to look darker, so I reduced the exposure a touch. Happy with the white balance, so no adjustment there. At this point, I can slap my preset on. It looks very good to me, but I will bring up the exposure a tiny bit and then move to one of my favorite part of the editing process, the masks. I love messing up with masks to reshape the light and make some adjustments to really bring my vision to life. It also helps a lot to bring the eye of the viewer where you want. For that picture, my goal was to make the light coming from this bulb a bit more intense. I opted for a radial filter with a high feather. Almost always when using a radial filter, I put my feather at 100 so you can have a really soft and subtle adjustment that will look natural. Increase the exposure, shadows and whites, reduce the clarity and dehaze to make the light a bit more diffused. Now we have a very nice effect, but it's spilling outside of this door frame, so I'm using linear filter and subtract them from the round shape of the radial filter really easy. If you hold shift while creating a linear filter, it will stay perfectly aligned horizontally or vertically.
Finally, I wanted to bring up a touch this red-orange bag kind of thing in the foreground to contrast with the blue from the guy jacket. I used the object Smart Select tool and brought up the saturation, contrast and white balance. If we do a before after the mask, you can see how powerful it can be. We just have to be careful not overdoing it. Let's quickly check a full before and after and wrap this video up. I will quickly do two little shameless plugs. I have a Patreon page where I post every month a one hour editing session with a downloadable preset that I created throughout the session. So head over to my Patreon if you're interested. And then of course my presets, I have uh, different packs available on my online store and I truly believe they are good quality ones and the income I get from the sales is helping tremendously for making a living out of these uh, YouTube and online activities. So thanks a lot to the one who already purchased them and if you're interested, head over to my online store. With that said, thank you very much for watching. I wish you a very nice day and see you soon. Bye.